So I just released this new edition of this prelude by Johann Sebastian Bach, and I've played this piece over the years, and I've avoided putting out an edition because every time I play it, I kind of change the fingerings almost every time. And so for this edition, I decided to lay down some fingerings, um, most commonly that I've used myself, but also I changed some of them um, once again as I approached the piece um, from another perspective. So I'll talk about that a lot in this lesson. Now, this is not a tutorial video where I'm going to show you how to play the piece. Um, although I will go through every bar and play through every bar talking about my finger choices, so it might actually accomplish that, but it's not the intention of the video. Um, I would imagine that if you're playing this piece, you're a pretty advanced player, and that you are simply interested in why I chose certain fingerings. Um, the other thing I'll say is that there's a lot of musical information that I'm not going to talk about. This video is really just going to be about left hand fingering choices. Since it is such a gigantic um, work of art and there's just, I could talk about it for hours, um, but I better get to the left hand fingering. One last thing, I'm going to go pretty slow during the, the piece, but the, the actual tempo... You know, is, is a quite a bit more peppy, right? And it really makes some magic out of the counterpoint in other sections. You know, it, it should all go quite a bit faster, but I'll be walking through it quite slowly. Um, otherwise, you would miss things, and it's hard for me to talk and play at the same time. One thing you want to do though, I mean, if you're at the level that you can play this piece, then you probably want to check out multiple editions. Like you should definitely, it's well worth your money to buy the Kuntz edition. Um, his fingerings are very reasonable. I don't agree with all of them, but nevertheless, they're very good and they're very solid. And so you'll want to look at other editions. In fact, if you're going to play this piece, it's going to be a major undertaking. You should get your hands on every single edition that you can. This piece is generally easy. But, like, 80% of it is really not that bad, but then the other 20% is really difficult. Um, there's no good fingering solutions, and so that's why you want to look at multiple editions, because um, you have to get creative with the solutions, and so you'll like some of my solutions, and you probably won't prefer um, other aspects of them. Um, another thing I'll say is there's, there's kind of two approaches to this. I mean, you can work from, like, having the ideal musicality, and then there's the practicality of playing it. When you're dealing with a difficult piece, you have to make some practical choices sometimes, otherwise the piece is just going to be too difficult to play. And of course, there's a happy medium where both of those things meet, and you have some good musicality with good fingering. The other thing is that you can approach things from um, finding the ideal fingering for a certain bar, and then working backwards through the piece, trying to approach that perfect fingering, or you can use a whole bunch of good fingerings and then deal with a tricky situation at some point. And so I'll also point out that. So um, there's not too many ways to start the piece. Like I would start it at the top. Um, one thing I'll say is that I'm not gonna use very many slurs today. And I didn't mark slurs in my edition because it's kind of like a personal choice. Um, I like it without slurs and I like it with slurs. In my experience though, adding slurs just helps the piece overall. It's really tough to play constant legato because the whole piece is 16th notes. It's just so much legato work that the slurs f facilitate legato. So if you wanna use some slurs, I, I highly recommend it. So piece starts off up in uh, ninth position here. So lots of shifting right off the bat and you know, there's other editions, like the Kuntz edition plays the G-sharp here, and then he starts doing some kind of cross-strung thing. Um, I've decided to go for more of a loop fingering, where I just like go down to first position, and then play a lot of the notes with open strings down there. So after this, I'm just into first position. Now, there, you could close the E, don't like the sound of the open E ringing, I kind of mute it out with my fourth finger. It's kind of weird. Then it's soft, right? Now, this.
this scale passage, there's so many different ways to do it. I've actually chosen to do a big jump. On the open E. I like the idea of like just one position and then your destination position. So I chose that. The alternative would be to go to fourth position. If you don't like the color difference between the third string and the open E string, then go to the fourth position and then move up. So, and that's one of the choices you have to make when you're playing a piece like this. It's like, do I do, I do something like super practical, like jump into one position? Or do I want a sound that's more, you know, a little bit more similar by staying here, but then you have to do two shifts. So it's like two shifts versus like a little bit of discoloration because the third string's a little bit muddy when it gets up here, right? So that's a choice you'll have to make. Um, I've decided to jump up. Um, then when I get up there, so I go, I do a big stretch down to seventh position. There's tons of solutions for that as well. Um, long ago, um, I learned a lot of this stuff by watching like John Williams play and stuff like that. And I think, I think, I don't remember, but I think that's where that comes from, that fourth finger slide along there. There's only so many ways you can do it though, because you do need those notes. But you can use your second finger and then stretch out, or you can just move your first finger up. It's not like later in the piece there's not going to be tons of shifts. So either way. So when we get to here, this is bar 13. Um, One position and soft. Now, that's kind of um, one technical chunk there, all the way up to that point. So we're at bar 17. So 17 to 29 is this big arpeggio section with lots of counterpoint. And I wanted to track down and end up here. So this is an example of a place in the piece where I chose a destination. I wanted to end up in one specific place, and I chose my fingerings kind of to bring me to that place. It causes some problems though, as we'll discuss. Um, in the Kuntz edition, it's pre he's pretty good. Like he decides to like, in the end, close, close the E here um, eventually, and then like do a big stretch. And it's pretty good, it's a pretty good solution. I have to say like, it, it works fairly well. Then, then you have to shift down and it's really not that bad or maybe actually maybe he starts playing the cross string stuff again up, up here but I wanted to end up down in second position so that I have a normal um, um, texture there so well this is how I did it so finger in so it's like a little weird that you have two and four there it's not bad it's not that it's not hard that's for sure and then four three because you need you need this this note to kind of ring over can't move your finger until well after well well into that first beat of the next bar there and then two then one then I do another weird move I move, put three and then two but you have to hold on to that note
the F sharp is ringing while you bring your third finger in. So you have to hold that F sharp until the last minute, then switch to your second finger. And then, and then I'm at my destination point that I planned to arrive at. So bar 17. destination first finger on the second fret so I mean like I'm not saying it's better than other fingerings it's not it's it, but like for me I like the idea of tracking these strings all the way down and then ending up you know in second position where I want to be for that next section um, and if you're if you feel like those chord shapes are weird just play them solid they're not that strange like once you get down to here Moving the fourth finger in is not that bad because it's so secure. There's just a little bit of finessing at the end when you have to sneak that second finger in. Okay, so bar 29. This is the first linking section between like two larger um, arpeggio sections and this is where the piece gets hard. Like up to this point, it's been pretty easy. Um, nothing too crazy, like intermediate players could play it. Um, but this section gets starts to get really freaky, um, so let's go through it. This is fine. Um, I shift up there. And then play it on the fourth string. That way bar 31 can be a bar A. stretch. Not so bad so far, right? Still not so bad. Some quick shifting there. Um, not much you can do about it. But it, it's fine because this figure is so strong. Here, I always, I, I used to cheat. Um, I used to have the opposite approach that I do now. I would play a good fingering here at 30 set bar 37. And then I would quickly hop my fourth finger over. But there was always a musical hiccup there and it kind of frustrated me after a while. So I found a different solution. So bar 37. Open. Third string, um, it's not ideal because it's it's pretty finicky and it's it's pretty complex, um, so it makes the passage kind of tough. But actually, it feels pretty good now, and that it just brings you, it allows you to just slide that second finger down and grab that chord, which you always need for this next section that that's so tricky right so that's my solution there's a couple of places in, in the piece where I've made these kind of complex fingering decisions and um, like I said though there's not that many of them in the piece so I chose it because it's the best musical decision for me in terms of like I don't want there to be hiccups in the music or like places where I jump a finger over um, so um, you just have to really know it though. You have to really like isolate that spot and memorize it and really know it. Otherwise it's just, it'll be too difficult, right? So bar 37. So you can go through this stuff. And then again, I shift up to the, to the fourth position so that I can do a bar A. A 
places in the piece where you have to like really do a, quite a stretch there from like G sharp to G natural or to F double sharp. This is actually not that bad. It's so secure. fourth fret though but there's not much we can do about that a little bit of a stretch for that sorry I'll just kind of speed it up a bit this part's fine Okay, so bar 51, um, that, that section is bar 51, and uh, it's going to be taking us all the way until around uh, 63. So let's see what we have to deal with here. This is a pretty tough section as well. So we just ended with this bar A, all these arpeggios, right? I don't have any good solution here, we just have to jump down. solution here I just you got to just jump way up to the higher position um, it's not so it doesn't sound that weird though Sorry. you just have to like kind of like do relax the tempo just a little bit and then place it sixth position so that's not bad I just stay in sixth position it works quite well there right <laughs> and then down to first position on that open string quite fully into the section yet. And then now we're going to be in another big arpeggio section. So not, nothing too crazy there, but like some very specific jumps um, and some like detailed like knowledge of upper positions as you like navigate. But it's pretty secure when you're bar A, when you have a bar A down and reaching out to some of those notes, it's really not that bad. It's just, it's you just kind of hold it and and reach out as you need to. Okay, so this section from um, 63 um, kind of heads all the way down to 79, so it's another big arpeggio section. And actually, this is a wonderful part of the piece that's a little bit of a relief because there's nothing too difficult in this section, which is really nice. That's the great thing about this piece is like, it's actually like 80% of it's like really not that bad. It's just a couple of areas that um, get pretty tricky and that last page is, is gonna be tricky. Um, so let's go from 63. I always thought this should be a, so a piano there because it's a repeat. There's no piano marked in the score though, but you could decide to do that if you wish to. And then 67. as to where the beat is because the, the bass note is on the on the second 16th note of the beat um, it can like really mess with your brain um, two things that you can do for, throughout this whole piece when you have any of that weird um, rhythmic displacement after, in these big sections is well count the beat out loud if you're counting one two three or sorry one two three but then 
another thing is just make sure, just practice accenting the main beat. Accent, accent, accent. And soften the rest of the material and you'll find that the structure kind of returns. But counting out loud is, is really, really helpful. I'm just, and you don't really want to wing it because lots of players kind of accidentally shift into the bass note being the actual beat when it's not, of course. So we're here at 75. so secure because you're holding on to things for so long that like this stretch here is it's tricky but it's secure so you just do it um there's probably other solutions you could do but it's tough to mix the sound of this closed a with the open a you don't want to like be switching back and forth too much because these they sound so different that it won't make sense like the voices should be independent so you don't want to mess with that sound color very much um but like i said you just you can do it because it's like pretty secure and secure oddity fingerings when it's secure are not so bad it's when they're insecure that the oddity fingerings are really tricky right so now we're at bar 79 and um it's another one of these sections there's not much you can do about this there's there's two voices i let them both ring out so an a on the sixth string and an open a so this is bar 79 It's this thing that doesn't work here at bar 83. Unfortunately, you have a B and a D. Unless you played the, the B up here. But even that, that sounds pretty muddy and gross too, so I just let it the B die. I mean, what can, what, what can you do, right? And get on with your life. a bit of an unfortunate area you could finger this differently I had a tough choice deciding I stayed in first position kind of weird doing that stretch between one and three there but you know I didn't want to like go all the way up here and do a bar A and then pivot back down I just stayed in first position not that bad um, but you can experiment with that particular bar bar 85 so in bar 86 you're pivoting into a bar a2 from the G sharp so you just kind of pivot into that so here that's not so bad just remember to keep your fourth finger down so that you can grab those two notes but unfortunately then you have to jump away again Seventh position, quickly reach out to fifth position. Then seventh position, pivot, oh sorry. And then pivot into a bar A, so this is bar 89. Tricky part here at bar 90. So you're barring the sixth fret. fourth finger so I can get into bar four and then we're changing again into seventh position sorry and then here this is a really tough section and I decided to use my third finger here so I could jump down. It's the best we can do. It's not that bad. You can do it fast, so 
Um, I thought it was pretty secure. But immediately you have to switch again. And then I, I reach out here. Pretty thick counterpoint in, in this particular section. That section has a lot of like um, intricate little things to remember, like tons of like, you're doing this and you're doing it with one finger, but then don't forget to switch to that other finger so you can reach down to this part. So it's just like a lot of work. It's a lot of um, effort you have to put in. That's what makes this piece hard. It's like, it's not that bad, but there's so many little readjustments that you have to make. So um, it just takes much longer to study this piece and that's normal for Bach. Um, you have to take a long time doing it. So 97. This isn't so bad. And the slur is helpful here. Bar 100. That's pretty weird that I did that there, but you have no choice. Like you run out of fingers all the time in this piece. stretching right like constantly in this piece it's always shifting always stretching but look how nice the fingerings work out you know it does work quite well um, so this is 102 uh, there's a bit of a stretch there what to do here and again this is one of those points before where I might have gone like and jumped fingers or done something kind of weird and I, I'm not doing that anymore it's, it doesn't sound musical so I go um, one one three three four you just can't use your fourth finger because you need it here and it's too hard to get right um, from this previous spot when I do big shifts though I always have a guide finger right um, it's 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 just absolutely necessary guide finger three uh, so that's 109 so and then this section is going to require a little bit of um, careful attention as well. In recent years, I've changed my posture quite a bit. I also have a slightly smaller guitar, um, so this part has become a little bit easier. Do you see that stretch there? That's pretty big. I but there's not many solutions. Like unless you want to let go of the bass. Whoa. You know this. This texture, it just requires that. You don't want to let go of it. And it's extreme, but again, it is secure because you're barring, but you better be ready for a stretch there. I haven't been able to find any alternative solution to that. So um, unless you like were to shift up or something, but because of that bass note, uh, that's the solution. And um, most people take that solution and it's just, it's tough. What can I say? There's nothing. Bother me as much as it used to though. That that part's kind of tough. And then you have to like get right back in. It kind of works. This is all fine. Oh, 
Oops, let me do that again. Another great example of a guide finger. Fourth finger, keep on the second string. Because you need it when you go fast, right? This is such a lovely part. right like I'm, I'm pretty much stretched to the max but what can I do because these arpeggio textures uh, it'd be a shame to break them up because they sound so lovely on guitar this is a bit of a jump a couple of those spots Slurs really help. Like, I'm not slurring much now for the video, but mm, pack this full of slurs if you can. <laughs> Amazingly, that works well. Bar 121, we're on the final page. little bit of relief in that section just for a couple bars it's like four bars long but you get some re time to relax and prepare for the end of the piece because it's all 16th notes okay so now things are gonna get pretty intense so this is bar 123 position, so first finger guide. Second position. Fourth position. Still fourth position. Second position. Reach out for the G sharp over here. Then bar 128. Careful of this bar. You gotta, you gotta get that little bar two in there. And then you have to go up to fourth position there, which is, um, you know, significant. This, this bar, I tried in 1,000 different ways, and I kept trying to find the perfect solution, but it just doesn't exist. There's no good solution. Um, I do this. So this is bar 129. Open. So I go up to like 10th position. It seems like it's not that bad when I do it slowly, but it's tough when it's fast. It's not that bad though. You gotta be ready for it. I think Kuntz does something like, um, he does it here and then, and then dives, dives up, but I just, it's just too tricky. It's not secure enough. I like this because you get to leave your third finger down. I thought that was a little bit more secure. Bar 130. Fourth string. So bar 133. It's really not that bad. Tuck the first finger in. Sorry. Third finger, I, that's what I do. Ah, some relief from the 16th notes. I go down to second position because I want to hold this chord. 
while doing all of that passage. So second position bar A. I like doing the cross string trill or uh, whatever it is um, that, that Kunz does, but um, you know what? Like you can't sustain the chord properly, especially this D sharp that um, wants to resolve to the E. So I keep it all in second position. The disadvantage is that you have to like hop into this bar five, uh, bar two, five. And you have to have this chord down and making it really tough to, to trill with that particular finger. My recommendation is first thing, um, ditch the extra B. You already have it in the bass. You know, you could easily do um, a nice little trill. If you get rid of that finger, it's not so cramped. But my recommendation is really to like, just, just work on the, the trill until you get it. That way you can sustain that chord. And that way, grab this chord. You're sustaining the D and everything. E. Grab the G sharp on the fifth string. I go up to 11th position. That way you get this triad here, and then this triad, this E major triad. Um, but of course this is a very advanced piece, so I imagine anyone playing this piece is really advanced enough to come up with their own fingerings and to debate my fingerings. So I highly recommend that you, you do that because it's a really healthy musical experience. I've debated these fingerings so many times that I'm like brain dead over it. Um, I, so, and I have to choose something to put on the page, so I, I've chosen that. But I've made that free unfingered edition to, to allow you to make your own fingerings and so that you can come up with your own solutions or whichever ones you prefer the most.